Hello everyone, uh, greetings wherever you are. Uh, this is Ondego Chien. Uh, I'm glad and grateful and I really thank God for the opportunity that he has given me to share with you the word of truth um, from the Bible. Uh, I know you are going to enjoy. I hope you will really, really enjoy. And I urge you to write these things so, uh, that you hear. I'm going to talk about um, understanding the book of Revelation, that's part two. And uh, this time round, part, this is part 2A of Evidence for Errors. Uh, this is what I'm going to discuss with you today. Uh, wherever you are, I know you'll write something. In fact, we have been told in the Bible, if I read uh, Revelation chapter 1, I think it's chapter 1 and verses um, 19. I know you're going to have your exercise book or maybe something. You're going to write this exercise. This, uh, uh, verses and maybe points that the Holy Spirit uh, will uh, give me to share with you. Um, the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 says, Write the things which you have seen uh, and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So, uh, good people, you can write. You can write the Bible verses that you are going to hear that will help you know to know what's going to happen now, uh, what has happened and what's going to happen in the future so because the same bible is telling us in the book of Ch uh, revelation chapter 3 and i think uh, verse 22 revelation uh, 3 verse 22 says he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches so if you have the ear le then you should hear what the spirit says to the churches so uh, as I've said, this is um, uh, part 2 of understanding the book of Revelation. It is part 2a, uh, where I'm going to discuss uh, evidence for errors. Now, uh, we have found out that the, throughout the religious community, uh, the book of Revelation is one of the most mysterious and mis misunderstood book in the Bible. In it, uh, the Apostle John uh, was taken in spirit to the throne of God, where he witnessed a series, he witnessed a series of awesome apocalyptic visions. So here we find that uh, as these dramatic uh, prophecies began uh, to unfold, the apostle was presented with seven distinct letters and instructed to send them to seven churches uh, located in specific cities of Asia Minor. So uh, these seven messages are uh, similar uh, to other epistles in the Bible uh, in that they contain both praises and correction uh, to the church. Uh, yet uh, uh, they are unlikely, uh, unlike any epistle, any letter uh, ever written. Uh, while other, other, other letters penned by John, Peter and Paul uh, were inspired by the Holy Spirit these seven came directly from God the Father through Christ and were di uh, dictated to John by the angels. So I think that's what we read there in chapter 1 verse 1. That says, and the angel of the, uh, it says chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, here uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, Things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So uh, that is the uniqueness of this book. Unlike other letters that were written by Paul, by Peter and by John. So here is the uniqueness. So we find that uh, this book, uh, what uh, this book is giving us a, a a picture of what happened, what is happening now, and what is going to happen. So what was God's purpose in recording these unique uh, messages? Were they intended only for Christians meeting in these seven cities, or were they included in the uh, entire book of Revelation for a greater purpose is it possible that the churches are symbolic and prophetic 
uh, like the other imagery in this uh, unique book. Could this seven represent the entire, the entire church exist, existing around uh, the world and throughout the time? Is it possible these letters were written to convey a vital message of hope and warning for us today? So these are the things that we should be asking ourselves as true Christians who want to know the truth. Because these people have taught different version of these uh, churches. Now, uh, we have uh, three views that people have uh, taught. There are currently three views regarding these three churches and their letters. The most fundamental of this considers the message to each congregation to be just literal. Those who hold this opinion believe that every epistle was written solely for the purpose of addressing the circumstances, strengths, and weaknesses of God's people lived, living during that time, the first century. I mean during the first century church. A, a second view suggests that the churches represent seven attitudes that would exist within God's church at any one time. Now, those holding this conviction believe that our attitude is a reflection of our spiritual state, which is always subject to change. Therefore, uh, there may be points, there may be points in our lives when we find ourselves uh, reflecting the moods, the standards, or spiritual condition of any one of these seven churches. Now, for this reason, you find that uh, the Savior told each congregation that he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. Now, according to this view, no matter what age we may live in, we should always heed the exhortation given to all seven congregations, according to this second view. A third perspective considers uh, the first two uh, interpretations as having some validity, but concludes that each letter addressed to its representative uh, I mean, respective church uh, is primarily symbolic and prophetic. Okay, advocates of this um, view believe the main purpose of uh, the letters is to describe the circumstances and spiritual state of God's people during specific times through history. They would encourage, warn, and correct the church living during the during each of the seven eras, existing from the time of John until the return of Christ. Now, there's something we need to know. It is possible that God's purpose for recording the, uh, these admonitions uh, was to send an important message to his people during specific times in history. Those who oppose this belief claim there is no proof that these letters were written for a let uh, for this latter time. For this later time, some even declare that believing in this in, in church errors can uh, can be harmful. They uh, they charge that this teaching may cause the believers to identify themselves with the Philadelphian era. By this, they may ele elevate themselves, causing division within the church. So that's how they claim it. Other opponents argue that the issue is irrelevant because uh, it has little or no effect on our salvation. However, this doctrine, this doctrine is enormous, uh, enormous. It has enormous importance. In fact, uh, it is one of the most crucial issues facing the church today as we live now. So uh, you consider, you may consider the immense uh, uh, value to modern Christians if these letters were actually written as a warning and reproof to people living at different times. 
If that is true, then this subject is not only important, it is of great significance. If these letters were written to errors of God's church, then there is a message among them for us. Living now. Imagine reading a letter of admonishment from Christ to you, directly to you. Such a message would make an enormous difference. However, what if we mistakenly believe that his message does not apply to us and ignore the warning? Such a judgment might uh, affect our eternal destiny. Yes. Mm. Even our salvation it might, might affect. But if we heed God's correction, it could be a factor that determines whether we are saved from the great tribulation. It can arm us with a profound conviction that might make a difference in the reward we might receive ultimately. The truth about church, uh, church error or church errors is invaluable. The action we decide to take as a result of Christ's warning and instruction could determine our future position in the kingdom of God. As the spirit of our uh, 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 spirit, our, uh, as the spirit of our age permeates deeper, deeper into the hearts and minds of God's people, the advantage of knowing the truth about errors becomes absolutely monumental. We are cascading in the time the Bible calls the last days. We should be picking up the pace in our zeal for God's way of life. Imagine we are in the last days, the very last days. Instead, and paradoxically, many of us are bogging down. <clears throat> we are slowing down spiritually. And some of our spiritual lethargy is due to the fact that... Uh, uh, the, the doctrine of church errors is not clearly understood and powerfully taught. As a result, many of us do not realize. They don't realize that uh, what spirit is, af uh, is affecting the church today. They don't know what spirit is affecting the church today. Vast numbers of God's people do not know what they must resist in order to overcome uh, uh, during this age. While some may accept that these seven messages were written to, uh, to, to errors of God's church as a growing number are very much unsure. In fact, uh, today some actually believe this teaching should be abolished. <laughs> because this varied op opinions, the doctrine of church, uh, errors is on trial. You see, we need to wake up. We need to be sure. This issue is so important and the consequences are very great. And uh, uh, I mean, this, the consequences people will receive for just igno ignoring is very great. That God's people must understand the truth. They should understand the truth. For this reason, evidence for errors presents seven ex exhibits. There are seven exhibits, each of which substantiates this doctrine. So uh, as each exhibit is presented, the conclusion will become more obvious, more profound, and more convincing. The facts uh, presented will convict us without a doubt that each letter uh, to the seven churches was written to God's people living during a specific time in history. The evidence will conclusively show us which error is predominant today and what we must do to overcome in our age. So it is very important to us. So um, we want to start with um, just beginning with one, Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1, the evidence of prophetic book. Now let's go. 
and you want to read i would like to read it from uh, my bible here in, uh, in fact uh, this is king james version which says so we have started with um, the exhibit one which is the evidence of a prophetic book that is exhibit one and i'll read second peter chapter one and verse 20 to 21 no prophecy of uh, scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men but holy men of god speak as they were moved by the holy spirit there i've read uh, king james version so we, here we find that, that the seven letters were set within the framework of a, a, a book that is entirely prophetic. The book of Revelation was written as a chronological record of events that would occur over vast periods of time. This is apparently from the very first verse in the book. Notice that the angel introduces Christ's vision with the words like this in Revelation chapter 1. And we are going to read uh, verse 1 in uh, New King James Version. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. So here we find that the, this opening statement marks us... Um, make two important points first the entire vision is directly to uh, to god's servants it is specifically directly to god's servants since john's uh, covers john's vision covers uh, events that were to take place over thousands of years uh -huh. so you should know that this vision was written prophetically to cover thousands of years. It is written to all of God's servants, including those who would live at the end of the age. That's now the exhibit of the evidence of a prophetic book. The book was written for thousands and thousands of years with an aim to discuss all that will happen during all the prophetic age. So, as we see here, that is one exhibit that we have seen. This is apparent uh, as the prophecy almost immediately moves to the end time, stating that Christ will come with clouds and every eye shall see him. So, you see that verse, I think it is uh, Revelation chapter uh, 1 and verses um, 1. Chapter 1, verse 7. I think chapter 1, verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So here we are seeing. Uh, second, this verse tells us that the entire book was written to show things that must shortly come to pass. By this, God is not referring to events that were to occur immediately. Rather, he is speaking from the perspective uh, of heaven in which Christ considers the last 2,000 years of man's rule as the last days. Yeah, in fact, if you go to the book of uh, Hebrews, let me see. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 and I think verses uh, 2. You want to read it from there. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. And the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, I'm reading from New King James Version. Has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the uh, uh, he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So you can see there. And uh, first letters of John, first letters of John, you wanna see? 
first letters of John. We are going to read um, John chapter 2 and verses um, 18. John chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Bible says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. So by that, we simply know that there is last hour. Now, therefore, the purpose of this entire vision is to reveal pivotal events that would begin, it would begin in the first century and continue right up to the return of Christ and even beyond and even beyond so we have seven letters we have seven letters to the church and it these seven letters are in one book so the savior instructed the instructed John to write everything he saw in the vision John then sent the entire record to the events to seven specific churches in the future occurrences, if the future occurrences had no relation to this congregation, the letters would not have been written. The letters could have not been recorded as an integral part of the same manuscript. So they would have been written to each congregation separately, as were all the other epistles penned by, the, uh, by, by, by John, James, Peter, and even Paul. Instead, uh, these letters, the seven letters, were included as an, uh, as an intrinsic part, intrinsic part of a book that is entirely prophetic. This fact generates the, uh, a vital question. Why would God send the entire book filled with these prophecies only to, the, uh, to these seven churches? the seven congregations, if they had no practical application for them? Why send warnings of the beast, the false prophet, the great tribulation, if these events have no part, no impact on them? The only purpose for giving the churches the entire book was to ensure that it was passed, uh, I mean it was passed, down to succeeding generations who would experience these things. The only way this prophet, uh, the prophecies would been uh, would be would have been uh, would have, would have made meaning is if the churches represented errors throughout time, throughout time. By recording these uh, prophecies and handing them down to to, to successive um, uh, eras, as each age come to pass, the church exi existing at any point in time would understand both the history that went before it and the circumstances it would have uh, it would face during its time. So, therefore, God intended. Um, these missives to be an uh, inherent part of the entire vision for a divine purpose. They are symbolic and prophetic. They are symbolic and prophetic. Their warnings and admonitions correspond to prophesied events that would begin in John's time and continue throughout the future of God's church and all of humankind. For this reason, the angel told John in the book of um, Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. I want to read it from King James Version. Okay, it says here, Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So that's Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 in King James Version. So this profound uh, introductory verses uh, were written to set the stage. It was to set the stage so that 
Christians could understand. They were they could understand as their respective era in time reaches or arrive. The book of Revelation is an, a calendar. It's like a calendar of successive world events that would begin in the first century and continue over vast periods of time culminating with the end of this age. This prophecy is Describes successive stages of a great war, great harlot, the great woman, riding a, 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 on top of enormous empire called the beast. They chronicle the rise of a great mechanizing, pivotal, I mean, the superpower. There is a mechanizing superpower coming, a modern day Babylon. Babel. They document the steps that are very pivotal in man's history, leading us to the unleashing of God's wrath just prior to the return of Messiah. They reveal the establishment of God's kingdom on earth and describe the creation of the new heavens, a new earth, and the glorious new Jerusalem. The entire book of Revelation is a, we, we can say, panoramic a prophetic chronology. And the message of the churches was set within the, uh, within, they were set within. It is an indelible part of the framework and purpose. And in fact, therefore, we, we find that uh, while these letters might have had an application for the congregation in, existing in that first century, they were engrafted with, within Christ's entire revelation. They, they are grafted, by the way, in the Christ's entire revelation. So that's what we should understand from there. They, these books or the letters, carry enormous meanings for God's servants who would experience latter or later circumstances. They were written to all of God's servants. Therefore, the messages within, within them, the messages that they contain within them, are inextricably tied to the forward march of history. The fact that the letters are directed to the churches existing at different times becomes more obvious as the letters to Philadelphia and Laodicea are read. The messages of these two churches are di directed to Christians living in the last days, not those existing during the first century. If we, if we can go and find out, I think, um, from the book of Revelation, we want to see it. Uh, because we want to see th this as... Many people may think that these letters are just written for uh, those people at that time. But they were written integrally to us. Most importantly, to us. In Revelation chapter 3, and we are going to read verses 20. You know, from verses um, 10 to 20. Let's read from verses 10 throughout um, 20. It says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out to, he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which, is, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, I think that's where we are now starting from there 14. This thing says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, 
the beginning of the creation of God, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you are cold or hot. Verse 16. So then, because the, uh, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Verse 17. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, <clears throat> miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and um, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye soul, that you may see. Verses 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. <clears throat> so, brothers and sisters, this is what the Bible says. Sorry. So, you see, based on these facts, it is evident that these uh, letters, these um, seven churches represent seven distinct eras of God's church throughout time. They were written to the Ephesian era in the first century, but they were also addressed to Pagamos, Smyrna, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So church errors, these are church errors that would exist centuries later. So here we have seen the evidence, I mean exhibit one. We are now going to exhibit two, exhibit two now. The exhibit two is the evidence of the number seven. Seven is a very significant number in the Bible. And remember, God does not just use numbers for, uh, uh, just for, uh, for the sake of it. If you read uh, the book of uh, Revelation chapter 1, and we are going to read uh, chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 20. Chapter 1, verses 20. I think there it is. It says this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my mouth is in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven uh, churches. In uh, King James version, uh, it says candlesticks, not lampstands. So throughout the, uh, the Bible, the number uh, seven is used to convey a symbolic uh, meaning. It is the number of completion. That's why we have seven days that completes a week. There are seven weeks uh, to count up to Pentecost. There are seven weeks of uh, years until the Jubilee. Noah waited in the ark seven days before the flood came upon the earth. And God commanded his people to eat and live and bread for seven days. So number, the number seven literally appears hundreds of times in the, uh, in the scriptures. And when it is uh, used symbolically, it always denotes what we call completeness. So uh, E.W. Bullinger discusses this unique uh, number in his book, Number seven, and is stating, and I read, in Hebrew, seven is Sheva, Sheva. It is from the root Sava, to be full of or satisfied, have enough of. By the way, in Kiswahili, it say, we say seven is Saba, while uh, here in Hebrew, Sava, it, uh, it denotes it means it's the root of Sava to be full of, satisfied, have enough of, 
Hence, the meaning of the word seven. The word seven is dominated from this root, seva. For on the seventh day, God rested from the word of work of creation. It was full and complete and good and perfect. That's what uh, Bullinger is writing here. As I continue reading what Bullinger has, ri has written here, he says, nothing could be added to it or taken from it without uh, marring it. It is seven. Therefore, that stands within with perfection and completeness, that in connection with which it is used. That is page 156 to 157 of Bullinger. Now, by this we know, we, we see that seven is the number of uh, God uses to portray uh, that which is complete. It portrays that which is complete. With this understanding, the, the, the fact that there are uh, seven messages sent to seven churches demonstrates an important truth. These churches must represent the complete New Testament church throughout the time. Therefore, uh, I mean, notice how, how Christ, Christ in, uh, used the, this number when describing these churches. We want to read it from um, uh, we want to read it from uh, the book of uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12 to to 20. I'm reading it in the King New, uh, I mean King James Version. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man clothed with a, a garment down to the foot and guard about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned into a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying uh, unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And of the keys of the hell and death, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. You see? Now, now, now let's see these candlesticks. I mean, in the New King James versions, they are called. Uh, in the New King James version, it's called lampstands. The Apostle John explained that that, the, that he saw seven candlesticks. It is important to understand that the, uh, Christ did not give John a vision of seven candles, each having a wick, surrounded by wax and and, and set in decorative holders, as we we see today. The Greek word translated candlesticks <coughs> is Lucinia, and uh, its literal translation is lamb stand. That is according to Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible. If you uh, go to G three zero eight seven, now candles were not uh, yet invented in John's time. In fact, uh, therefore, the apostle was describing a lamp and not a candle. He was describing a lamp, not candle. That is the reason why I've read the, 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 the King James Version, so that we can explain that. Our modern candles likely began with the Egyptians who first uh, uh, put beeswax over the, the reeds that they gathered until, I mean, they gathered along the, 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 the river Nile. <clears throat> These were more like, uh, like they were more like uh, torches. It was not until the Middle uh, Age, the Middle Ages here, 
uh, that wax was used with a wick. So at that time, candles became uh, they, they, they became the chief source of artificial light. It was this kind of light the King James version, uh, the King James translator is using. Uh, they were familiar with that. And likely, the reason they translated Lucinia as candlesticks. So in John's day, the Jewish uh, people used a device that was closer to the, uh, the, the, the that thing called menorah. Menorah. As described by the prophet uh, Zechariah, prophet Zechariah, uh, in Zechariah chapter four, in verses, um, uh, uh, let's let's read it. I think we can get it there in Zechariah four. We'll go and read it from verses two to four. The book of Zechariah chapter four, and verses two to four. It says. I'm reading now in New King James Version. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven la uh, lamps. Two olive trees are by it. One at the right of the bowl and the other at its left and verse 4, so I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So you see, in the lampstand, oil was distributed from a, a base to the lamps, various conduits. Uh, uh, the flame would heat the oil and the, uh, the, 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 what? the resulting vapor burned at the end of, the, uh, of each branch, each of the branches. Therefore, each lamp bore its own light from the one main source of oil, which is a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. This imagery represent, uh, represents the spirit of the one true God flowing through the leaders that Christ would send. His spirit would ensure the light of truth they preach during each era. During each era. And it would burn brightly because this is Holy Spirit so we can see here uh, we can see while introducing the letters Christ uh, gave us the key to unlock this mystery because this is a mystery notice that he does not say that the candlesticks are seven of uh, the churches but rather uh, they are the seven churches they themselves are seven churches you see, since seven is the number of, uh, of of completion, these candlesticks must represent the entire church of God. You see. Now we find that the, the, we we see that the entire book only sent to seven churches. Were they just sent to the seven churches alone? That is what we have to see, and we have to delve in that. Imagine Christ revealing prophecies that would uh, occur over thousands of years, yet sending them to only seven specific congregations in Asia Minor. However, that is exactly what Christ commands. Let us see. Let us see in uh, King James Version, Revelation 1, verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia and to Ephesus, and to, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pagamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. That's, uh, I mean, that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. The, the prophecies covered in the book of Revelation are of enormous importance to all of God's people. Yet at the time of their unveiling, Christ's sent them only to seven churches. Now, why? 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 Did the Savior want to deny the other congregations uh, access to this information? Did he withhold it from the congregation in Jerusalem, congregation in Thessalonica, Philippi, Colossi, or others? Of course, he couldn't have done that. Now, uh, Christ was not withholding information from any other congregation as we can see. The truth is that the entire book is the 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things that must shortly take place. I think that we have read it from Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. By this he gave warning and hope to all the churches um, who would read this book of Revelation. Christ commanded that if it be sent to these seven without uh, mentioning the others because these specific churches were symbolic and represented seven church eras. All of the congregations existing during John's uh, time were included in the first era. I mean, at that moment, there were several other churches. The ones in Philippi, the ones in Colossae, the ones in Corinthian church, you see. So, they were included in the first era and would ultimately have access to the book. So, this is another piece of evidence that these seven churches, these seven churches represent the entire book the entire church over the course of history. So there, there might be an, uh, other churches in the Asia Minor. Uh, when Christ instructed John to send these letters to the seven congregations, it must uh, be understood that they were not the only churches of God in, that, uh, in, in the province of Asia Minor. While the seven, seven, um, the seven were located in the cities, 30 to 50 miles apart there were several other congregations uh, I mean in close proximity so for example we had Hieropolis uh, it was located south of Philadelphia and uh, approximately 6 miles uh, north of Labishia so Colossi was situated 11 miles to the south of Laodicea therefore the apostle Paul wrote to them he states in um, in uh, Colossians chapter four, uh, uh, verse thirteen. Uh, I'm reading in um, in in, in uh, King James version, the old one. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you. I mean, for the church in Colossae, and then that are in Laodicea, and then in Hierapolis. That is uh, Colossians chapter four, in verses uh, thirteen. So. Besides Hieropolis and, uh, and Colossi, two other churches are noted in history, and we have seen. We have uh, uh, Magnesia, we have Magnesia, and tra tra uh, we have Tralis, this Tralis, where congregations positioned on this same route, connecting uh, the other churches. But they were not introduced by Christ in the scriptures. So this means that a minimum of four other churches existing along this same route were there. So knowing this, why, why, why uh, did the Messiah only mention seven? Did he favor the brethren uh, in these seven cities? No, Christ has no favoritism. Christ is without partiality and does not play favorites. If you read James chapter 3 verse 17, I will not read it. We must understand that. In a book of prophecy, the number seven is a symbolic. Since seven is a number that means complete or whole, these seven churches represent the entire church of God. They picture all churches, uh, all churches. You see? So these seven churches represent the entire church of God. They again pictures all believers around the world and throughout time. Now, here yeah, we have seen that these churches represent entirely all the churches around the world and all the time. Thus, Christ likely chose these, uh, these seven churches. This, uh, I mean, you call them seven congregations or seven churches from among all those in the, uh, in the province because they, they, they most closely represent the seven church eras that would... Uh, occur during uh, during or occur throughout the what the through history so here we want to see the the, the messiah we have been told is in the midst of this is in the midst in the middle of these seven churches it is also important um, to note that messiah is descended i mean is in the midst is described described in the in, in, uh, being 
is described as being in the midst of this, we call them lampstands in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. In the same page, passage there, the same scripture there, uh, we've uh, seen very well, they are seven. In the middle there is our Messiah. He told us plainly that the candle stick, or we call them lampstands, are the seven churches in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. We have read that. Since Christ is and always has been in the midst of the, uh, the entire church, this truth stands as further evidence that these seven represent the entirety of, the, uh, of his church throughout time. Each lampstand portrays one era of the church of God. Now again, we have something called the seven angels. So uh, as the book of Revelation begins, it says that there are seven stars in the Christ's hand. We are then told that these stars are the angels of the seven churches. I think if you read again to in Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 and verse 20, it is pros, uh, pre, uh, we say that it is preposterous to consider that only the seven churches in Asia Minor had angels representing them. If each of the churches in Asia had a separate angel, then the congregation of, in Jerusalem, Macedonia, Colossae, Galatia, Europolis, and Rome would, have, would also have a separate angel. Then the congregation in, the, how do we call it, the, the other congregation in other parts would have also have their own angel. If this were the case, then Christ would have been uh, depicted as having a dozen or more stars in his hands. However, he is shown only with seven stars only in his hand. So by this, the prophetic number seven continues to instruct us. As the seven candlesticks or lampstands represent the entire church throughout the uh, uh, history, these seven stars also reflect the seven angels who would preside over the church at respective points in time. Each angel would be responsible for their specific era when its time arrived. Now, who are these seven angels? Let's see. In the first chapter of Revelation, Christ is described as being in the middle, midst of the seven golden lamps and thunder having seven stars in his right hand, he explained that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. I think uh, you, you will go back and go back many times in Revelation 1 verse 20. Some have thought that these angels are human leaders or pastors or apostles of each church. Other, others believe that they mm, are literally angelic spirits. Uh, they, they are angelic spirit beings. Now, what is the truth? Those who believe the term refers to uh, the term that term refers to angelic beings cite the fact that the Greek word is angelos, meaning a messenger, especially an angel. If you go to Strong's uh, uh, G32. In addition, the book of Revelation uses the word 77 times, and nowhere does it appear to mean the other than uh, to mean other than angelic beings. Also, the symbol of a star is used to represent angels in seven other churches. If you go to Job 38 verse 7, you'll read it. Isaiah 14 verse 13 and Revelation 9 verse 1. On the other hand, Strong's also state that by implication, Agilus can mean a pastor in G32 of the Strong's. In fact, the Bible occasionally uses the word angel in reference to a human messenger. In Malachi chapter 2, I think, verses 7, a priest would give instruction. A priest who is giving instruction is called a messenger. And, um, yeah, it's called a messenger of the Lord. Now, later, the, individually, the individual announcing Christ's return at the end of the age is also called a messenger. You see? I think if you go to Malachi chapter 3, in verses 1. In Matthew 11 verse 10 also we see um, uh, Agilos is used to refer or to identify John, John, John the Baptist. 
it is used when referring to re representative to a, a I mean representatives sent to Jesus from from John. I mean, if you read uh, Luke chapter seven and verse twenty-four, it is also the term used in James chapter two, verse twenty-five, when speaking of the spies who were protected by Rahab. In addition, stars are sometimes uh, a reference to human beings. For example, in Daniel chapter 12, verses 3, we are told that this, those who lead many to righteousness, they shall shine as the stars. And in Jude chapter 1, I think verse 13, Jude is just a continuous book. Uh, false teachers are called wandering stars. We must also recognize that God has never used a, a human to a to deliver a message to one of his angels. Nobody has been used to deliver a message to an angel. You should know. Yeah. Since John was told to write unto the angel of the church, it is unlikely that they, uh, he wrote messages intended for the angelic beings. <laughs> God does not uh, need our assistance to instruct angels. He can't need our assistance to instruct angels. God does not need it. Christ simply would have relayed these messages to the uh, to, to them himself. He could have relayed the messages to, to angels. So from the evidence uh, we recognize that the word angels can refer both to um, uh, to both spirit beings and human beings. You see? It can both refer to to what? To human beings and angels, so this can be confusing. But perhaps a solution can be found in uh, in, the, in the in the in the in the what in the duality. This, I mean, we, we do say that uh, prophecy is dual. Duality that pervades the Bible. Scripture often sets a, a physical representation of uh, that which is spiritual. There, there is um, the earthly reflecting the heavenly. That is uh, in Romans chapter. 1 verse 20. For example, uh, we have uh, man on earth is made of the image of God in heaven. We see there is the first Adam and the second Adam. The Bible says that Christ is the second Adam. There was a physical temple on earth and it is, um, yeah, there's a physical temple on earth. And it was patterned after spiritual what? Spiritual temple in heaven. There was physical Israel and uh, later spiritual Israel the church in light of such duality so we see it is possible that this same twofold representation is found in the angels of these churches from the example of the damsel uh, who upon seeing peter thought uh, she had been uh, she had seen an angel i mean we realize that there are guardian spirits being uh, spirit beings the spirit beings over god's people as Peter had uh, an, an angelic assigned to him. There's an, an angel was assigned to Peter. Uh, it is possible that each era has both an angelic being and human messenger associated with it. Consider that as, as a servant of the Almighty, the angels in heaven minister to protect them and influence the human heirs to the salvation. If you read uh, uh, I mean the book of Hebrews chapter 1 in verse 14. As the angels in heaven brings messages from God to men, God's human servants also bring messages from God to other human beings. In this way, the statement angels to the seven churches could be dual, representing both spirits and uh, uh, a human church leader. So, brothers and sisters, I think it is very well that we have discussed from the introductory part of uh, the church errors, and we have seen the exhibits because we want to see the exhibit. Uh, I mean, as, as that can dis tell us more about the evidence for errors of these churches. I know when we meet again, we will start by the evidence of the male root that will be uh, understanding the book of Revelation, part 2b. So stay tuned, uh, as I've said, you can uh, as well subscribe, you, you like, 
and even comment because you have opened the comment side. And may God bless you so very much as you continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much.